So good morning, everybody. Good morning, Grace Life Church. I want to start off this morning and just say how absolutely excited I am and how honored I feel to be sharing this fourth segment, as Dawn uh, said. We've been involved in a series called Resolving Everyday Conflict for the last four weeks, and I have the privilege, essentially, of closing this off. The fact of the matter is, as Dawn said too, that we all have conflict when we have relationships. As Craig shared during his first preach, that where they are, two or more gathered, so there will be conflict. And that's, that's the truth, and it's how we actually deal with it. Let me put my stopwatch on quickly, sorry. Otherwise, we could be here all day. <laughs> So just to recap on um, the first three weeks, uh, Craig uh, shared the first week on glorifying God and essentially how when we are going through our conflicts that ultimately we should be glorifying God through that process. Week two, uh, Ryan shared on taking responsibility for my part and we all know how easy it is to want the other party to take the responsibility and you go, hey, this is not my responsibility. But the truth is, it's a two-party thing. Uh, Dawn shared last week on um, confrontation and peacemaking and essentially how in certain circumstances we are called to face that confrontation head on and then seek the healing that comes through that process. So if you've missed any of those, I'd like to encourage you to go onto Facebook. They're all there, and they follow in a specific order. It's like reading a book. Essentially, when we open a book, we don't miss chapters. So they're all there. Go and take a look at them. So this morning, I'm unpacking the aspect of forgiveness and restoration and how we should permanently see this as a resolution to our relationships. The fact is that we can attend to the first three parts of the series. We can glorify God, we can take responsibility, and we can make peace. But if we hold unforgiveness in our hearts, we are really going to struggle to find restoration in those relationships. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? We've got to find that forgiveness to attend to the whole matter. You know, God is, he's got such a sense of humor. He never ceases to amaze me. And I'll tell you why on this occasion. So a few hours after um, I learned I'd be sharing this segment, I was standing in a queue at Spa. So let me start off by saying that even though the series predominantly is about resolving conflicts within the bride of Christ, within the church and between each other's believers, obviously uh, we don't just, uh, you know, have conflicts maybe in this arena, but it's throughout our lives. So this specific occasion is rather on the outside. I was standing in Spa Tuesday evening paying for some goods. Um, There was a man that was standing in front of me, probably two feet away. We were social distancing, so don't worry, okay? So we were standing there. He turned around, obviously just to glance at who was behind him. And our eyes are locked and engaged. And I recognized him immediately. And I saw that he recognized me immediately too. He tensed up like this, and so did I. And (laughs) the story goes... Some years ago, this man had engaged in business with us. He'd um, taken some equipment and he hadn't had the, um, we hadn't had the privilege of receiving the payment for it. So I had tried for a period of time to get him to pay. There was a conflict that had happened between us and it had not been resolved. I hadn't seen him again over time. I'd forgotten about this specific thing. But that specific meeting brought back all of those feelings that I'd had during that conflict period. He went and paid, I went and paid, and we went our separate ways. And I thought over the next couple of days, how should I have dealt with that? Maybe a little bit better than I did. I felt maybe I should have walked outside and just decked him one, give him one, you know? Maybe the fist of five. That would have sorted that out for me. (laughs) Obviously, that's not the truth. The truth is that it was unlikely that he would have come and paid me 
after so many years. I should have taken the opportunity to go up to him and say to him, I want to release you of this debt to me. There's two really specific reasons for that. The first one is that I need to release myself. We need to release ourselves of those feelings of anger and hurt, essentially, of how we're ever going to move forward. And obviously for him too, for him to do or accept that would have set him free on anything that was unresolved inside of him. It could also have restored our relationship to a point where maybe he came and paid us back. I don't know. At that particular point, I missed the opportunity to do that. So there's three points that I have this morning that I want to speak about. And the first point is our position. That's what I've called it. When it comes to forgiveness and restoration, our position is incredibly important. What position are you approaching this from? As a, a young boy, and even now, I, one of the pastimes I enjoy doing is hiking. I love the Drakensberg. And I remember one specific occasion, I was following behind my dad a little distance, and I approached a ravine, and he navigated part of the ravine, and I remember as I was trying, he turned around to me and he said, son, you cannot get here from there. There was an impasse which was in the way of the destination. A ravine or a mountain can block the road to your destination. Impasses occur in travel, we know that. But impasses also occur in our relationships. A steep ridge, for example, can stand in the way of a road's course. Resentment can mount up between two people. A deep canyon can separate two locations. Mistrust from an offense can break friendships. A mountain or cliff can lead, lead to a dead end. Unresolved hurt and anger experienced through conflict can end relationships. In due time, the fact is, every relationship that we have will encounter some type of impasse. So the question is, how do we position ourselves so that the roadway between me and you, between us, can be made good again. So I've asked that question. What do we do when we have questions? Where do we look? We look to what Jesus says about those specific circumstances. So let's look at probably the most well-known and famous sermon that Jesus ever did. He did it at the beginning of his ministry and essentially it's a set of teachings on how we should live our lives. If I could sum it up, it's, um, if I could sum it up in one line, it's actually called the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what it would be summed up for me as, how to live a life that is dedicated to and pleasing to God, free from hypocrisy, full of love and grace, full of wisdom and discernment. I don't know about you, but that's how I want to live my life. So let's read it, Matthew 5, 23 to 26. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid back the last penny. So that's quite a scripture that. The motive, the motive in positioning ourselves 
where we want to forgive and reconcile is so that we can be reconciled to our Father. How can we as believers seek reconciliation and relationship with our Father? Yet our earthly relationships between our brothers and sisters lie in tatters. It's not possible. We have to make sure that in our earthly environments that we are dealing with our earthly conflicts. It says that we should hold short accounts because we never know really when we're going to be going home. The second aspect I have, sorry, the second um, point I have is the aspect of forgiveness. So Jesus tells a great parable, which we all know very, very well, but it's a parable about um, forgiveness and reconciliation. I just want to chat about it for a little while. It's the parable of the prodigal son, and this specific parable is full of forgiveness and reconciliation, so we know it quite well in brief. Two brothers, one father. Youngest brother decides that he wants his inheritance or his part of his inheritance right now. Maybe he decides that he wants to, you know, spread his wings. He uh, wants to, you know, there's something more exciting than being at home and being with the family. His dad unbelievably agrees to do that. Most fathers wouldn't. His dad did. Off he went, it says in in the scripture that he went off to a far off land. A far off land would indicate that it's a place that's difficult to get to. There was an impasse that he created between himself and his family. In due course, he goes from living the high life, says there he was having serious parties, He was spending his cash. He was enjoying himself. But the cash started to run out. He went from living on good food on pigs to eating and having to feed the pigs. At some point, he must have realized that this was not where he wanted to be. But he didn't know how to reconcile that relationship between himself and his family. He gets a message through to his father. He said, Dad, I want to come home. Doesn't know what his dad's going to say. Eventually, he says he wants to come home. But because he doesn't understand how to reconcile that relationship, he says, I want to come home. I'm going to be a servant for my family. Off he goes. It says in verse 30, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. His son trades, sorry, his father trades his son's tattered clothes for fine garments. He covers his calloused bare feet with shoes. The wayward son didn't see any way possible to resolve that conflict and restore that relationship. The truth is, it was through forgiveness from a loving father that that relationship was able to be mended. He was restored to his position. It's the same with us, friends. Forgiveness has the power to restore broken relationships. It removes the obstacles which are choking our bond. It opens up the impasse and creates a new way. Forgiveness simply cannot be found and conflict resolved on a permanent basis while we are carrying hurt and anger. If I said to Clint Brown, for example, Clint, not that I would, he's probably twice my heart and <laughs> with two. I'm really angry with you, Clint. 
The fact of the matter, it would be an absurd thing to say. Or you've made me angry, Clint. It's an absurd thing to say. Clint has not made me angry. I've made myself angry. We're in control of our own emotions. We decide what buttons to push and who to be angry with. In Colossians 1, it spells it out beautifully. It says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now... He has reconciled you through Christ's physical body, through death, to present, to present you holy in sight, without blemish and free from accusation. You see, friends, this scripture really spells out forgiveness. It's how essentially through first Adam, we were condemned for our sins, but a, a, a way was made for forgiveness for us when Jesus came he came as second Adam he presented our sins on the cross so that we could have our relationship reconciled with our father all of our sins past present and future dealt with in one swift cross The truth is, friends, that as I said, even though this this series is predominantly about relationships within uh, the bride of Christ, the world yearns for forgiveness. If we can't get it right here, we're not demonstrating very well to the world. Uh, um, I want to just share something. It appeared in a Spanish newspaper, and it's a story about a father and a son. There was an impasse that separated their relationship for many, many years, both of them holding unforgiveness. The father eventually decides that he needs to forgive. He cannot allow this thing to continue any longer. But he has no idea where his father was, no idea where his son has gone. He searches high and low for him, but to no avail. Eventually, He decides that he's going to have one last attempt. He's going to um, put an advert into a newspaper. And this is what the advert sounded like. This is a message for my son, Paco Garcia. Meet me in the plaza in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. Off off he goes on uh, Saturday at noon. He's got some butterflies in his stomach. He doesn't quite know what's going to happen. Is he going to be there? Is he not? He arrives at the newspaper stand and is absolutely blown away. In front of him are 800 Paco Garcias. (laughs) All wanting a restoration in a relationship between themselves and their fathers. Friends, the world needs forgiveness the world needs restoration and it's down to us to do that the third point that I have is reconciliation through fellowship so the story of the prodigal son doesn't end with all relationships restored the story of the prodigal son is essentially left for us to write the ending There's a relationship, and that's the relationship between the two brothers that is not restored. It says that the older brother is angry and hurt, that the younger brother has been restored. I'm sure we can sympathize with that. He's stayed at home. He's... um, you know, being the one that's been working and continuing to, to, to run it. I mean, how would we feel, you know? Maybe that's even you here. I believe that in writing the end of that story, if the two brothers had spent time fellowshipping together, spent time reconciling, speaking to each other about what had gone on, that fellowship would have built 
a strong or even stronger bond between those two brothers. Friends, we have received the greatest gift possible, divine forgiveness through Christ our Lord. I think Dawn shared this during her segment as Peter found out when he asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Once, twice, 10? There's got to be some kind of limit. <laughs> Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times. Not 77 times, friends. Just as our Father forgives us, for every sin so we too are to do the same with our brothers and sisters you see friends it's love that motivates forgiveness and reconciliation I have a scripture that I want to read to you that highlights this Corinthians 13 4-7 love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. You see, friends, it's a father's love that motivates us to forgive and to reconcile. I want to tell you now something. Somebody came onto my heart this week. I didn't know the story particularly well, but God just dropped her into my heart this week. And I ended up giving her a call to ask her to tell me her story. And I was blown away. It's a, it's a hectic story. Mijan, can I ask you to come up? So I'm gonna ask Mijan to tell her story. If she doesn't feel that she can do it, it's fine, it's incredibly emotional for her. We understand I, I will do it for her to the best of my ability. So, so this is Mijan. Okay, all right. Okay, so come and stand here. All right, let me try and do this justice. So I'm, I'm going I'm to share the circumstances behind it, and then if she wants to share a bit, she can. So a few years ago, Mijan went out to pick up her children from her mom's place. It was, I think, early evening. They'd been out somewhere. Her mom uh, wasn't answering the phone, so she decided just to leave her kids and I think go home. She noticed that there was a taxi that was parked quite close to her and didn't think too much of it. She lives in uh, Yellowwood Park and if you know the road to Yellowwood Park there's a bridge that runs over the end to and then down Kenyon Howden Road and she was driving along and approaching the bridge the taxi came up behind her and tried to bump her off the road well it was very successful at that it bumped her off the road and her car rolled down the embankment onto the N2 motorway the men got out of the car and they ran down the embankment and they pulled her out of the vehicle and they pulled off her jewelry and they dropped her on the side of the road. For two weeks, she was in hospital in a coma.
for three months, she continued to have to stay in hospital. She had to go to rehab for a year to learn how to walk and talk again. Her injuries were brain injury, fractured skull, fractured shoulder blade, broken sternum. All the ribs on her one side were broken, punctured lung, broken collapsed bone and shoulder, shoulder out of joint, nerve damage to the left leg, permanent double vision. And just on top of that little pie that our enemy baked for her, he threw in depression and suicidal thoughts. <sighs> Sorry. Do you feel okay to share a bit, maybe about how you felt um, essentially when you came into a relationship with Christ? Give it a try. Um, okay, so the first few years were very, very hard on me and I just went down and there was nothing left for me to do except just go down on my knees and pray and ask the Lord to help me. And I cried out to Him and I said, I couldn't do this on my own, I cannot, I need you. And just by doing that and putting the Lord first and having that relationship with Him, I was able to, in time, forgive and put it behind me. So friends, all I want to say is, let go and let God. Beautiful. Sometimes I think about my own stories, you know, my little conflicts that I have, and then I compare it to a story like that. It's nothing compared to that, friends. She said to me that one of the desires that she had when, when I spoke to her was to essentially be able to use her story as a testimony to help other people to be set free. Understand when you enter into a relationship with a loving father, how you can have restoration no matter what the circumstances. So in closing, friends, why don't we stand up? I just think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to maybe respond in some way. If you are holding unforgiveness in relationships that are broken, where you feel you've been wronged, it could be from a broken marriage. It, sure. Yeah. So... Uh, so Majan, Andrew spoke to me. I said he this Majan, he wants to, wants Majan to share this share this uh, this message and what she had gone through. You can bring a bit softer, guys. And uh, <clears throat> I just said to him yesterday, of course, because she's not reconciled to the guys that were in the other vehicle, of course. So well, how does this connect to you? Because remember, the series is about reconcil reconciling everyday conflict. And it's about impacts that we have with other people, specifically in the church, but it can be our family, our friends, our, our wives, our spouses. Amen. So that with Majan, actually it connects in this way, is that, that of course there had to be forgiveness. And the, the root cause with a lot of our conflict is that very thing. And if God can do that, can, can set her free, although she hasn't been reconciled to those people, of course not there's something that we can learn from that and take, take what she's, what's happened in her heart there and be reconciled to someone that we have a conflict with that we feel maybe has knocked us off the road and stolen our jewelry. Amen? In other words, they've caused us harm. They've caused us pain. Remember what Dawn said last week, if your brother sins or sins against you, it could just be a perceived thing. I had, but I just want to talk this through. I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be a peacemaker and I want to talk this through because this is how I'm feeling. Amen. And for the, for the sake of our reconciliation and for the sake of our peace and for the sake of the gospel, I want our hearts to be reconnected again. But we need to walk in forgiveness. Amen. Yeah, thanks. Uh...